Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you here today at the Vista. If we haven't met before, my name is Austin, and we're so glad to have you here today, especially if it's your first time. A lot of us remember how hard it is to go to a church for the very first time, and so we hope that you feel loved, welcomed, and wanted. You fit right in and make yourself at home here at the Vista. As you can probably tell, my, my voice is a bit scratchy today. There's really nothing to be done unless one of you has a word from the Lord. Jason, you got anything you want to share with us? Maybe next week. Maybe next week. I'll be fine. We'll get through it. Um, today we're in our series, second to last week, called Fakers, Breakers, and Makers. The premise of the series is pretty simple. Namely, conflict is inevitable. You will have conflict every single day of your life. And handling it well is gospel work. Because conflict provides us with a very unique opportunity to show the world what the conflict resolution that we call the gospel looks like because instead of faking the peace or breaking the peace God makes peace with us through the life death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and so every single day when you have that conflict you have an opportunity to show the world what the gospel looks like when you handle it the way God handled God's conflict with us right think about that every single day you have opportunity every single day you have uh, uh, every single day you have conflict every single day you have an opportunity to show people the truth beauty and goodness of the gospel. So far, we have been uh, walking through different texts in the gospel of Matthew, namely in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 and 6, listen to what Jesus has to say about conflict. Today, we will be in Matthew 18. For the next two weeks, we'll be in Matthew 18. So we'll start off here, verses 15 through 18. It'll be on the screen for you as well. This is Jesus talking. It says, if your brother or sister sins... Step one, you go and show him his fault in private. Now, if he listens to you, then you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, then you take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Now, if he refuses to listen to them, then you tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 18. So one of the things I have noticed over the years about the way I, and I think most of us, interpret the Bible is we have this habit of acting like the Bible is clear, where it's actually a little bit unclear, and then acting like the Bible is unclear, where it's actually pretty clear. So, for example, and I know there are kids in the room, but I just, I have to say this bad word as an example. Politics. You all okay? I said it. Oh. Yeah, I know a lot of people who think the Bible very clearly teaches us how to vote. And go figure, uh, all the Democrats think the Bible very clearly teaches us to vote Democrat. And all the Republicans think the Bible very clearly teaches us to vote Republican. I know this is shocking. And to be clear, it is fine and good and necessary to have opinions as to what the Bible teaches about politics, right? Politics is just another word for our social life together, and the Bible has a lot to say about our social life together. But we dare not pretend that the Bible, written thousands of years ago by ancient people in very ancient cultures, speaks directly and clearly as to how modern Americans should vote. And so have your opinions, absolutely, and make your arguments, absolutely, but don't forget that your opinions and arguments are not necessarily God's because the Bible is not a voting pamphlet guide for modern Americans, right? When God's speaking through Moses on Mount Sinai, how arrogant is it to think that God's like, all right, now we're going to give a few words about modern American politics, Moses. You're not going to understand this, but people in 3,000 years will. Right? That's not what the Bible is. You get it. We often act as if the Bible is clear where it's actually more than a little unclear. Then on the flip side, we often act as if the Bible is unclear, where it's actually pretty clear. And I cannot think of a better example of this than when it comes to what the Bible has to say about how we handle conflict. Because as we have seen throughout the course of this series, and then especially in our text today, y'all, you saw it, the Bible is so painfully clear about how to handle conflict, isn't it? It's like conflict resolution for dummies. Hey, here is step one. 
if it doesn't work, when it doesn't work. Here's step two. Here's step three. This is what you do. And yet, uh, I, I think we have this unbelievable ability. We are so good at pretending like the Bible is unclear about how to handle conflict. So we can then pretend like we don't know how to do it. Anybody else do this? I'm always, you know, I'll be in conflict with someone. I'm like, God, I just... I don't know what to do. It's so complicated. Lord, please send me something. Tell me what to do. A sign, a vision, a dream. I'll take anything, Lord. And then God speaks to me and he's like, read the Bible, you dummy. I'm like, Lord, is that the Bible? Oh, no, it's, it's so complicated. It has all these very confusing things to say. No one could possibly understand it. God is way too complicated. And God's like, no, nah, man, it's really not. It's like one-on-one. I dummy proof this one for you. And so what we're going to do today is we're just going to walk through what Jesus has to say about how to handle conflict. We're gonna start here in verse 15. If your brother or sister sins, maybe your translation says if your brother or sister sins against you. That phrase against you was added in later manuscripts and you know what happened, right? Everybody was running around trying to handle everybody's sin and then the community was like, ah, maybe we ought to narrow this down just a little bit, right? If your brother or sister sins against you. Let's focus on that. So the first thing we need to note is that in context, Jesus is very clearly talking about some kind of pretty serious sin here. Because notice, Jesus does not say, hey, anytime you think that somebody maybe, sorta, kinda, could have possibly maybe sinned against you, maybe, then you need to make a really big deal about it. This is not what Jesus says here, and we all know people who do this, don't we? We have perhaps all been people who do this, the uh, self-appointed moral litigation lawyers, you know any of them? Always accusing and blaming people. One of my favorite shows is called Curb Your Enthusiasm. Any Curb Your Enthusiasm? Fans in the house, uh, thank you, Ronnie. I feel so seen right now. Um, the show's uh, writer and star is Larry David, and he's the guy up there in the picture. He wrote and produced Seinfeld as well. And the premise of the show is basically Larry walking around being the pettiest person on the face of the planet because everybody annoys him and everybody offends him, and he picks fights with everybody about everything. The way people park their cars, you know, when they're too close to your line, you can't get your door open. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, when people don't sit him at the center of dinner parties, he likes to be in the center and play point guard with the conversation. It's a skill set to be at the center of the table for a dinner party. He especially hates it when people use his bathroom to go number two and you know that bothers you too right when someone comes into your house you hear that first flush and then the second and then god forbid the third it's a very very annoying thing to have happen to you his favorite saying i'm going to get this tattooed across my chest one day is this i love mankind in general it's people individually that i hate <laughs> and so while jesus he you know he wants us to be proactive in the way we handle conflict he does but he doesn't want us to become a church full of Larry Davids, a petty community of the constantly aggrieved where we are constantly complaining and picking fights with each other. Or as, as Solomon said it, perhaps more wisely than Larry David, Proverbs 19, 11, this is a good verse. Those with good sense are slow to anger and it's their glory to overlook an offense. Yeah, say this little verse to yourself before you post that thing on Facebook. Those who are wise are slow to anger. It is their glory to overlook an offense. All that to say, when someone sins against you, the first thing that you should do is consider whether or not you should just overlook it. So, for example, a few weeks ago, when some of you showed up to church wearing 49ers gear the day of the Cowboys 49ers playoff game, you thought I didn't notice? I noticed. We convened the elders. We thought about excommunicating you, but we decided to overlook you're offense, but if you do it again, you're gone, okay? You get one chance, there's a line, you wear that 49ers crap again, you're gonna find where the line is. Not bitter. So when somebody sins against you, there's a chance you need to just get over yourself and let it go. Not everything's worth fighting about, but if it's a more serious sin, then you need to bring it to him or her directly and discreetly and confront slash talk to him or her about it. This might just be my impression, but I get the feeling that this is in the running for the most violated command in the whole Bible. Anybody else get that feeling? I don't know about you. When somebody sins against me, the first thing I do is I complain about it to somebody else. All right? Instead of going directly and discreetly to you, I go indirectly and publicly to somebody else. That's what I do. And the technical term for this is triangulation it's a little psychological term here triangulation i weaponize my grievance with you by sharing it with others and then recruiting them to my team triangulation 
And notice how quickly Jesus' conflict resolution process can go off the rails here. Because conflict resolution is meant to be this process of me being for you and for us. In other words, conflict resolution, y'all, and this is so simple, but this is the first thing you gotta get. It's not about me beating you. It's not about me beating you. It's about me being for you and for us and for the bigger church at large. But all this gets ruined from the start when we start with triangulation. Because what we've now set in motion is not conflict resolution, but it's what? It's conflict escalation. It's relational cold war. Because my mission is very clearly not me for you, but me against you. It's not us for you, it's us against you. All that to say, if my first move when you sin against me is triangulation, is bringing somebody else in, then I'm probably sinning. Because if I'm not willing to talk to you about it, then Jesus says I probably shouldn't be willing to talk to somebody else about it. That's what Jesus says. It's pretty simple, right? Pretty clear, pretty direct. But it does beg at least a couple of very important questions we need to explore. His two questions are this. How is that fair? And then is that safe? All right, let's take these in turn. First question, how is it fair that when somebody sins against me, right? Let's get this clear. Somebody sins against me. It's somehow my responsibility to go to them and be all holy and pious and Christ-like when they're the ones who messed up. How is that fair? And guys, I, I, I'll be honest with you, this is one of Jesus' teachings that I do not like very much. It's right up there with love your enemies. You know, if I'd been around when these manuscripts were getting put together, snip, they'd be gone. <laughs> Seems like there's something missing on this manuscript. Nah, nah, no, that, that was it, that's all he's. I don't like this one very much. It's a very difficult, very difficult teaching. Um, and, and, and when I read it, I can't help but ask myself, because this is how I feel, why am I being made responsible for your sin? You're the one who messed up, not me. So why does the process start with me coming to you instead of you crawling to me on your hands and knees on burning asphalt and broken glass begging for mercy that I will maybe give you? That's how I think the conflict resolution process should start. So how is it fair? Why does God ask us to do this? And the short answer is, well, because that's what God and Christ did for us. That's the short answer. Because when we messed up, when we mess up, not just when we mess up, when we mess up, what does God do? God doesn't just sit back and go, well, you know what I mean? If they want to come to me and ask for forgiveness, then I would think about it. But ball's in their court. They're the ones who messed up. Is that what God did? And when we messed up, God took responsibility for our sin by lovingly confronting us in the crucifixion of the Son of God, and he has commanded us to do the same for each other. All that to say, is this fair? Heck no, it's not fair. It's very, very unfair. But you want to know what it is? It sucks, in fact. But you know what it is? It's the gospel. That's what it is. And thanks be to God, the gospel is not fair. So that's number one. Question number two, is this safe? This is a very nuanced and complicated question. Man, I've been chewing on this one for a few weeks. And it's complicated because this text can be and has been used as a, as a pretext, as a cover for bullying and abuse, as a pretext for forcing people in very abusive relationships to confront their bully in unhealthy ways. Sadly, over the years, I have seen more than a handful of women who have been in abusive relationships, and I've seen their spouses use this text to try to keep them silent. You better not tell anybody else about it. Jesus says you have to come to me. You better not let anybody else in. And so hear me really loud and clear on this, all right? If somebody is abusing you, laying his hands on you, is hurting you, then you need to tell somebody about it. Because that's not triangulation, that's intervention. And it needs to happen. Because Jesus has no patience for bullies. Jesus loves bullies, he loves them so much he's not gonna allow them to stay bullies forever. And shame on us when we use Jesus to shame and bully others. All right, so to say it loud and clear, Matthew 18 cannot be a cover for bullying and abuse ever. Now that said, while Matthew 18 cannot be a cover for bullying or abuse, neither can we just 
ignore Matthew 18 with impunity. Because here's the deal. We are really good at convincing ourselves that we are exceptions to the rule, aren't we? I I don't know about you, but I always think I'm the exception to any rule. You don't understand. My situation is so complicated. I have all these really good reasons why I can't do what Jesus told me to do here. And again, sometimes that's true. Okay, we just talked about instances in which that might be true. But much of the time, most of the time, it's not. And many of us have become far too comfortable utterly ignoring Jesus' guidance about conflict resolution here. We just completely ignore it. We're totally comfortable with it. Um, Somewhat related to our discussion on modern fragility and safetyism a few weeks ago, one of the primary ways that we avoid practicing Jesus' teachings on conflict resolution here is by calling our situations unsafe when they're actually just really, really hard, okay? And I want you to hear very clearly what I'm saying here. There are situations, we just talked about them, in which you should not go directly and discreetly to those who have sinned against you because it is genuinely unsafe and we need to bring in others. I have seen those. I have walked with people through those. Those situations are awful and they are tragic and we disrespect people who are in genuinely unsafe situations when we call our situations unsafe, when they're actually just really, really hard because y'all, conflict is hard. Handling conflict Jesus' way is hard. Marriage is hard. Friendship is hard. But that usually, not always, that usually does not mean that it's unsafe. It usually, not always, it usually just means that it's hard. All that to say, you need to be wise and discerning in how you apply Jesus' guidance here. Absolutely. But if you are constantly convincing yourself that it doesn't apply to you, then it probably especially applies to you, okay? At this point, we're halfway through the first verse, so we will pick up the pace a bit. Somebody sins against you in a way that should not be overlooked. You go to them directly and discreetly. They listen to you. It's all good. But notice, not because you won. What does Jesus say? But because you won your brother back. I love that. It's not about you winning. It's about you winning the relationship back. But, you know... Sometimes it it doesn't go this way. Because when you have two sinners confronting each other about sin, it doesn't always go according to the script, does it? Mm -mm. Not in my experience. So when that happens and it doesn't resolve, then you need to bring in more people at this point. But please, for the love of God, use your brain when you do this. Because while Jesus is telling you you need to bring in others at this point, Jesus is still not giving you permission to triangulate against someone. And so when you bring in somebody to help mediate the conflict, don't bring in your mommy to be your lobbyist. How do you think that's gonna go? Oh yeah, this conflict, well you know what, I'm gonna bring my mom, you'll have to listen to her, she's very objective. Don't bring in your mommy lobbyist at this point, bring in people who are mature enough to genuinely want what is best for all sides in the conflict. And then the other thing we need to note here is that Jesus, clearly assumes that we will have wise people around us who can help us in these times of need and conflict, right? And this is true, not just of everything Jesus says about conflict, it is true of everything Jesus says, it is true of everything the Bible says, everything the Bible says assumes community, everything. We are not legalistic about this here at the Vista. We've got Vista small groups, they're great. I would love for you to be in one, but whatever, man. You got a supper club, you got friends and family that you're close with, it doesn't matter. We're not legalistic about it, but if you are not in community with people who are in Jesus's community, then you're not gonna really be able to do anything the Bible says, right? Period, full stop. I have people all the time who come to me and they want help, but they refuse to submit to and get in community, and so I tell them at the end of the meeting, hey, there is nothing I can do for you if you're not willing to submit to community. All right? Everything the Bible says assumes community. So take somebody with you, confront the person again. If they still refuse to listen and repent, at that point, you tell it to the church. That's what Jesus says. This is a very misunderstood verse, so we need to get some clarity here. We need to be very clear that the situation and vision is one in which somebody has and probably still is committing very serious sin. 
And they've been given multiple opportunities to repent but have refused to do so, at which point the wider church body is then used to try to help someone repent. And so this text may not be used as a pretext for busybodies. You hear that, busybodies? Huh, 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 what? Busybodies who enjoy gossip and exhibitionism and think they are entitled to know about other people's flaws because no, you are not entitled to know about other people's flaws, but there are times in which the church body as a whole must be used to try and help a sinner repent. That is what Jesus is talking about. This is not permission for you to spice up your boring life with gossip, all right? And then if they won't even listen to the church, at this point Jesus says that the church is to excommunicate them, treat them like a tax collector. And look, there's no way around it. This is a pretty tough text, isn't it? It's important to first note that the situation that Jesus is describing is one in which somebody's sin is so serious that everybody in the church agrees, everybody in the church agrees that this person needs to be excommunicated. That's the situation in vision. And so excommunication should never be something that a church's leaders use to bully or shame imperfect people. Because right? if we kick out all the imperfect people, y'all, there will be no one here. Or it's not something for church's leaders to use to silence people who just happen to have some questions about something. And hopefully this goes without being said, but y'all, our leadership here at the Vista, it's not perfect. It's very flawed. We have made mistakes. We've made huge mistakes. We will continue to make mistakes. We are a very imperfect church, church leadership, mainly because of Dave. Um, (laughs) done everything we can for the guy but (sighs) it's important to us that you know that we know how imperfect and flawed we are and so we would never use excommunication as a tool to bully or shame imperfect people all right now that said excommunication is pretty clearly taught in the bible right you just saw it as a last ditch effort to try and help a sinner repent the most uh Famous, infamous example of it would come from 1 Corinthians 5. You remember the story? You got a guy who's sleeping with his stepmom. Apparently everybody's cool with it. If you're sitting next to your stepmom right now, I am. Sorry. Um, (laughs) So Paul says, hey, look, you got to kick this guy out, man. This is why. Here's the rationale he gives. You got to kick him out for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 5. Verse 5, and so notice that the ultimate motivation for excommunication is what? It's mercy, not punishment. It's mercy. The ultimate motivation for excommunication specifically, but then just church discipline more generally, y'all, it's not punishment. It's mercy. It's always mercy or it's wrong. I love how Stanley Harawas explains this. Y'all know Stan's my guy. He says, excommunication is an act of love. Excommunication is not to throw someone out of the church, but rather an attempt to help them see that they have become a stumbling block and are therefore already out of the church. Excommunication is a call to come home by undergoing the appropriate penance. I think this is so well said. Excommunication is not about kicking people out. It's about trying to help people come back home. That's what it's about. How so? By helping them see the ways in which they have excommunicated themselves through their love of sin. And we all need that reminder. This brings us to my favorite part of the text. It's one of my favorite moments in the entire Bible. Jesus says that when all of this has failed, you know, you've gone through all of it, it has all failed, then you are to excommunicate them and treat them like a tax collector. Hmm. And so how does Jesus treat tax collectors. Hmm. You remember what gospel we're in right now? Anybody remember what Matthew was? Ah, that's right. He was a tax collector. It's interesting. Let's read this story about how Matthew came to follow Jesus. This is Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. And he said to him, hey, you follow me. Matthew got up and he followed Jesus. 
Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came, and they were doubting with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and the sinners for God's sake? When Jesus heard this, he said, well, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. You go and learn what this means. I desire compassion, not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous. I came to call the sinners. And this is how Jesus treats tax collectors. Isn't that good? Oh. Jesus Christ was the most demanding person to ever walk the face of the planet, right? Some of these pictures of like naive, laid back, hippie Jesus, nah, that's not the JC there in the book, man. Mm -mm. Not a very laid back man. Not a very laid back man. Jesus was demanding, most demanding person ever. He demanded that we forsake everything to follow him. But Jesus Christ was also the most merciful person to ever walk the face of the planet. And all these years later, here's Jesus still drawing sinners to himself. Look around the room this morning, y'all. 2,000 years later, here's Jesus Christ calling all these sinners home because he demands that every one of his creatures finds mercy. And for that little blip in cosmic time, bloop, for which Vista Community Church gets to exist, and it won't be long, man. Blip, we'll be gone. Our hope is that we would be a place full of demand, gospel demand, but even fuller of mercy because that's the gospel. Let's pray together. Gracious God, thank you for today. We don't deserve to be here. That's very hard to remember. And so every Sunday we get a chance to slow down and remind ourselves that every breath in, every breath out is a grace that we are not entitled to. God, we come before you this morning, and I know there's a lot of conflict in the room because there are a lot of humans in the room. A lot of us have been wounded in some very deep ways. A lot of us have wounded people in some very deep ways. The guidance you give us here is very difficult, Jesus. And so we know that you meet us in our struggles. You're sympathetic with our, our struggles. But at the end of the day, Jesus, you are too stubbornly committed to our good to let us get away with not handling conflict the way you asked us to. And so I pray for courage on behalf of many of us. We're in very hard situations. And I pray that you would give us the courage to go directly, discreetly to those who have wounded us begin the process. I pray for those who are in unsafe situations, God, that you would give them the courage, the boldness, the strength, that you would get rid of the shame for them to bring others in to help them and help the person who is, in fact, hurting them. And Jesus, we pray that, man, anywhere else in between we are on that journey, whatever kind of conflict we have in our lives, that we would first off, though, just pause and remember that at the end of the day, all will be well and all manner of things will be well because you have already conquered all through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's the most important thing, and that's going to get the last word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.